This is going to be an overview of the book of 1 Kings. And the book of 1 Kings covers from the death of David to the death of Jehoshaphat. It covers the history from its greatest prosperity to its downfall. In this book, you will see the death of David, Solomon being crowned and made the wisest and wealthiest king in history. Also in this book, you will see the kingdom divided. The twelve tribes of Israel were united under a single throne during the reign of Saul and David and Solomon, but then after Solomon, they're divided. After the death of Solomon, the ten tribes break away to form the northern kingdom, and this northern kingdom is referred to as Israel, and all of the kings from this kingdom will be wicked. Then the other kingdom is made up of Judah and Benjamin. The kings of this kingdom are successors and heirs of David. So kings and Samuel present history from the human standpoint, while Chronicles gives the same history from God's viewpoint. And 1 Kings has 816 verses and 24,524 words. And a very simple breakdown would be chapters 1 through 3 are about Solomon being crowned king. Chapters 4 through 11 is stories of Solomon as king. Chapters 12 through 16 is the dividing of the kingdom. Chapters 17 through 22 talks about Elijah the prophet. So in chapter 1, David is old and stricken in years, so they seek out a fair young virgin to lay in his bosom so that he can get heat, get his blood flowing a little bit. And you men don't need to try this at home now. You say, well, David did, but he fought Goliath too. Do you want to do that? You want to do everything David did, then you'll have to fight Goliath. In chapter 1, you also have David's eldest son. One of his remaining sons. As you know, Amnon and Absalom were both killed in the last book. And one of David's remaining sons, Adonijah, wants to be king and establishes himself as king. In 1 Kings 1, 5 through 6, it says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at the any time in saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. So his father never displeased him in saying, Why hast thou done so? So Adonijah wasn't kept in check. You need to keep your son in check or he'll wreck his life, just like Adonijah does. Notice that he exalts himself. And God's rule always turns out to be true in Matthew twenty three twelve. And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. So you came to God as a guilty sinner for salvation. And now when you approach God, do so knowing that you still need his mercy and grace every day. Do so knowing that you need him through every situation. Don't exalt yourself and think you're something when you're nothing. Nathan the prophet tells Bathsheba to inform David that Adonijah is reigning as king instead of Solomon. Solomon is David's other son. And this reminds us, reminds us of a common occurrence that the man isn't listening to God. So God has to get the man through the woman. So Bathsheba heard the preacher, Nathan the prophet, and then she has to go tell her husband what the preacher said. You see that many times. A common thing you see is a woman who goes to church and she's saved. Her husband stays at home while the pastor and the woman get a burden for the man. And she relays to him what the preacher said. And even in 1 Peter chapter 3, it talks about the husband being won by the good conversation of the wives. So don't give up hope. If you've got a lost husband, you can win him over just by continuing to live as a good Christian. But David ends up pro proclaiming Solomon, a type of Jesus Christ, as king after he hears the truth of what's going on. Just like a husband hears the truth from his wife, 
believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, after he hears the truth, he makes Jesus king of his life after he gets saved. So David, after he hears the news from his wife, proclaims Solomon as king, just like many times a husband will proclaim Jesus as king because of his wife. So you see the picture there. Then in chapter 2, you have the death of David, proving that great men, no matter how tough, no matter how strong, no matter how brave, it still comes your time to die. As the Bible says, and as it is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. And if God let David die, do you think you won't die? Ecclesiastes 3.19 says, For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. As the one dieth, so dieth the other. Yea, they all, they have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast. For all is vanity, all go into one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. So, I'm going back to the dust. My body's going back to the dust. We're all going to die. In chapter 2, you have Adonijah scheming yet again. He goes to Bathsheba because he wants Abiashag to be his wife. Now, you see, Abiashag was that woman, that, that fair young virgin that laid with David. It's one of David's concubines. This would be yet another attempt to take the throne from Solomon because Abishag was David's concubine, so Solomon has Adonijah executed. And this pictures Jesus Christ killing the Antichrist right before the millennial reign of Christ. Adonijah, obviously, is a type of the Antichrist. So Solomon, one of the greatest types of Christ in the Bible, begins his reign with a judgment. Solomon's reign pictures the reign of Jesus Christ during the millennium, and his reign also begins with a judgment. But that judgment that Jesus' kingdom begins with, you can read about in Matthew twenty-five thirty-one through 32, which says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory, and before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. So here you see the judgment of the nations, which happens before the millennial reign. And as I said, notice that Solomon has to judge men before he starts his kingdom. In 1 Kings 2, 44 through 46, it says, The king said moreover to Shimei, Thou knowest all the wickedness which thine heart is privy to, that thou didst to David my father. Therefore the Lord shall return thy wickedness upon thine own head. And King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before the Lord forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, which went out and fell upon him, that he died. And the kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. So Solomon has to knock off some people when he gets on the throne. And in chapter 3, Solomon takes Pharaoh, king of Egypt's daughter, to be his wife. And he did these intermarrying with other people because he wanted to get some political gain. But this would be his downfall. In this same chapter, Solomon also prays for understanding and the Lord gives it to him. In 1 Kings 3, verse 7, it says, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child, I know not how to go out or come in. And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen, a great people, that cannot be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thy so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, Neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked the life of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. 
And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days. So Solomon didn't ask for riches. He asked for understanding. So in your prayers, pray for knowledge, wisdom, and understanding concerning the words of God. Solomon quickly shows his wisdom in the matter of the two women who claimed to be the mother of the same child. One really wasn't the mother, and Solomon quickly finds out who it is. In 1 Kings 3.23, it says, Then said the king, The one saith, This is my son that liveth, and thy son is the dead. And the other saith, Nay, but thy son is the dead, and my son is the living. And the king said, Bring me a sword. And they brought a sword before the king. And the king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son. And she said, O oh my lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, Let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. So then the king answered and said, Give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. She is the mother thereof. And all Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do judgment. So this shows you a mother's proper affection toward her child is for it to live, which is common sense, and this is contrary to abortion. But the woman that was really the mother didn't want Solomon to cut it in two. It would rather... Solomon give the baby to the woman that wasn't its mother than to have the child die, while the one that wasn't the child's mother didn't care. So in chapter 4, to give you an idea of how wealthy Solomon was, it says in 1 Kings 4.26, And Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses for his chariots and 12,000 horsemen. And to give you an idea of how wise he was, in 1 Kings 4.30-32, it says, And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country, and all the wisdom of Egypt. For he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Kolkol, and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame was in all the nations round about. And he spoke three thousand proverbs, and his songs were a thousand and five. So he was wiser than all the big dog wise guys of his day and every bible believer would have wanted a copy of solomon's writings you would have just had to have it you know you would have had to have your bible a good concordance and solomon's writings all of them you could get you'd go to his bookstore just buy them all up you know like today the bible believers want you know david walker's book on rightly dividing they want the sheer word of prophecy by ruckman they want dispensational truth by Clarence Larkin back then they would have wanted a Bible a concordance and Solomon's writings there and in 1st Kings 4:33, it says and he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon even unto the hyssop that springeth out of the wall he spake also of beasts and of fowl and of creeping things and of fishes and there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard of his wisdom this puts you in mind of how men will gather to hear Jesus Christ in the millennium. Because it says, From all the kings of the earth, there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Jesus Christ in the millennium will have the same thing happen. So yet again, Solomon pictures Jesus Christ. And if you read in Isaiah 2, 3, it says, And many people shall go and say, Come ye and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways. And we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So Solomon also reigns during a time of peace, as Jesus Christ's earthly reign will be a time of peace. First Chronicles 22, 9 says, Behold, a son shall be born to thee, who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about, for his name shall be Solomon, and I will give him peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. So Solomon's reign was peaceful. 
just like the Lord's reign will be peaceful. In Isaiah 9, 6 through 7, it says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. So you, you have the Prince of Peace, Jesus, and Solomon who reigned during a time of peace. There's many similarities between Solomon's reign and Jesus' reign. First Kings 5.5 5, And I, and behold, I purpose to build an house unto the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord spake unto David my father, saying, Thy son, whom I will set up on my throne in thy room, he shall build an house unto my name. So in chapter 5, Solomon makes a deal with a man named Hiram, who is a lover of David. And he will give Solomon lumber to make the house of the Lord, and Solomon will provide food for his household. So today, the Lord's house is the church, made up of every born-again believer. It's not the building. It's the every born-again believer makes up the church. And you can help build the house today by winning souls to Jesus Christ or by edifying other Christians. This house Solomon built was not for the Lord to live in, but for his name. Notice it says, And he shall build a house unto my name. So when the house was being made, you didn't hear hammers, axes, or any tools. As you read in chapter 6 and verse 7 in the house when it was in building was built of stone made ready before it was brought thither so that there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building so that's a cool fact and solomon overlaid all the house with pure gold in 6 38 it says and in the 11th year in the month of bull which is the eighth month was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof and according to all the fashion of it so was he seven years in building it so it took seven years to build it seven the number of perfection and you'll find that number seven throughout the bible something interesting is solomon took 13 years on his own house too bad it took longer on his own house than he did on the house of the lord Plus 13 is the number of rebellion in the Bible. So that number is also connected with the Antichrist. And Solomon, who is a type of Jesus Christ, is also a type of the Antichrist. And I'm pretty sure he's the only person in the Bible who's a type of Jesus and the Antichrist at the same time. So in chapter 8, we see a look into Solomon's heart on how he felt about the Lord. In 1 Kings 8, 22 and 23... It says, And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on earth beneath who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. So although Solomon stayed away from the Lord, straight away from the Lord, he knew who the true God was. Early on, he was, he was very right with the Lord. And this is so true in the life of many Christians. They stray away from the Lord. They live for the flesh, the world, and the devil. But they know they're doing wrong and they know who God is. Uh, you can be at work around a bunch of lost people. And, and I come in reading my Bible and that other Christian in there who was blending in with the lost people immediately begins to get under conviction. And I've had them tell me that they want to do right. And seeing me have my Bible in there... It began to be a, an encouragement to them to do right. So even the, a, a Christian that's out there living like the lost world, they still know that they need to be doing better most times. That shows me a safe person has a heart for God, like Solomon had a heart for God, who did many things. He did many wicked things, but still he knew God. He knew God was the only God. 1 Kings 8.22 And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven. This is an incredible verse. Here you have the wisest man on earth who is also the richest man on earth who is also a king lifting his arms up toward heaven to God. Did you know it would be hard to humble yourself to do that with all that power that Solomon had? 
you could have anything at your fingertips with the snap of a finger, and Solomon could, it would be a lot harder to live for God. But he had his hands up toward heaven, outstretched, just like a, a child does to her father when she wants to be picked up. And my daughter is afraid of dogs, and when one comes in the yard, she has a terrified look on her face, runs straight for me with her arms stretched out and reaches up at me and you hate for her to be scared but there is something about that situation that you love because it shows she needs you and that she's looking to you for protection so i think god feels the same way when we are in troubles and distress down here and we put our hands up and pray to him and he picks us up and keeps us safe from the dogs but in chapter 10 you have one of the greatest stories where the queen of sheba has heard of the wisdom of Solomon and comes to test out his wisdom and what she heard turns out to be true and this is also a picture of when Jesus Christ will be in the millennium and the Gentiles will come to hear what Jesus Christ has to say in 1st Kings 10 1 it says and when the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord she came to prove him with hard questions and she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she communed with him of all that was in her heart. So the queen of Sheba also pictures a lost sinner. She hears the fame of Solomon, a picture of Jesus Christ. And she goes to him with a very great train. This pictures the sinner coming with a whole bunch of works, thinking it will impress the Lord which it won't. And it says, And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king, which he told her not. So as Solomon told her all her questions, and he told her all she wanted to know, when you get saved and open this book, you'll find out that pretty much anything you want to know, there is an answer for it in the Bible. There is an illustration for it in the Bible. So once again, we see Solomon as a type of the Antichrist. Look at the weight of gold that came to him in a year in chapter 10 it says now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold so if score if a score is 20 and you have three score that's 60 so 600 60 and six talents of gold 666 in verses 14 through 29, you see the number six, six times. In 1 Kings 10, 19 through 20, it says the throne had six steps, and the top of the throne was round behind, and there were stays on either side on the place of the seat, and two lines stood beside the stays, and twelve lines stood there on the one side and on the other upon the six steps. There was not the like made in any kingdom. So the throne had six steps, Six lines on one side, six lines on the other side. Once again, six, six, six. Which that number, you know, that's the number of the beast. And people make jokes about talking of numerology in the Bible. But if you have done much study into it, you will see there is something there. First Kings 10.23 says, So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom. Now notice 23. 2 times 3, once again, you have another 6. So Solomon got lifted up in pride on his throne because of his riches and wisdom, which matches the devil. As it says in Ezekiel twenty-eight seventeen, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. So in chapter 11, you see Solomon turn from the Lord. And the Lord raises adversaries against Solomon. This shows me that God can put men in your life to torment you as a judgment. But then he will turn right back around and punish them for tormenting his children. He did this with Solomon. He did this with Israel. He does it with Christians. So Paul was given a thorn in the flesh. And I believe thorns are people. And I've had a thorn many times in my Christian life. But the thorns just make you better. 1 Kings eleven fourteen says, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. So he's got an adversary stirred up against him now. When before, when he was doing right, he was having a time of peace that was similar to the time of peace we'll have in the millennium. In 1 Kings 12, 
it shows you when the kingdom gets divided. And the rest of First and Second Kings talks about the different kings of Israel and Judah. And I'm not going to go in great detail on the kings because I plan on doing a study of the kings after these overviews are finished. But the, uh, this, these books also go into Elijah and Elisha. I want to do studies on those characters separately as well. But in chapter 13, you see this tragic story of the young prophet who was slain for disobeying God's words. He had just got done preaching to Jeroboam and ended up being deceived by an older prophet. And a lion ends up killing him. And in chapter 14, you see Ahijah the prophet and Jeroboam's wife. Ahijah lets her know that her, that her baby is going to die. Her son is going to die. Both Jeroboam and his wife mourn the death because what Ahijah said comes to pass, comes to pass, and this shows natural affection towards your kid. Even these wicked people like this mourn the death of a child. Whereas you see people today, they don't even bat an eye; they'll murder thousands and thousands of babies. But to give you just a simple list of the kings mentioned in First Kings, it goes like this: Jeroboam. Read about him in chapters. 12 and 14 reigned 22 years. He was a bad dude. He caused Israel to sin. Then you have a guy named Nadab. Read about him in, in chapter 15, verses 25 through 27. He reigned two years. He's also a bad guy. And he was killed by a guy named Basha. So this guy Basha reigns for 24 years. Read about him in chapters 15 and 16. Basha helped keep Israel on an evil path. Then you have Elah, who reigned two years. Read about him in 1 Kings, uh, I believe, 16, 6 through 10. He was assassinated by Zimri. So the Zimri guy gets to reign a whopping one week. Read about this in 1 Kings sixteen eleven. He committed suicide. You also have a guy, King Omri, in chapter 16, Verses 16 through 28, he reigns 12 years. He's a bad dude. Then you have Ahab, who's a very, very bad dude, who reigned 22 years. And he's known for marrying Jezebel, uh, that, that hussy. And uh, Ahaziah reigns two years. See him in 1 Kings 22 and on into 2 Kings. But like I said, I plan on doing a study on all these kings. So that's just a brief list. And I hope this is kind of whet your appetite for the book of first kings i hope it's inspired you to maybe read it for yourself and see all the fascinating stories and things in it and just get up every day and read the bible love the bible fall in love with the bible and i hope this overview has been a help to you